You're tuned into Toby Talks, episode 22, From Bedside to Director of Nursing. So when I first started my nursing career, I literally had to write goals of what I wanted to be, you know, what I saw my career becoming in the future. And I remember some of the top things were like director of nursing, COO, like big leadership positions. And I had to research on what do I have to do to get to those positions? Like, how do I need to start grooming myself now to get to where I want to be in the future? And I remember looking up job requirements for like a director of nursing. And what shook me was when I saw like 15 years of experience in management, 20 years of the, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Like all my life, I'm just going to be a nurse on the floor before I can get into a management role. And I was a little taken back by that. And I was like, well, you know what? I don't know if I see myself in 15 years becoming a director of nursing. I could see it in five or 10 years. But, you know, I never really saw anyone in that position to say that that's something I can do. You know, it's kind of hard when you don't see anyone that looks like you or maybe in your same age range that is going for that goal or is in that position already. But Lord, 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 today's episode had me shook. If you recall back in the summertime, I did a wonderful episode with Sharon, and she went from bedside to nursing manager. Well, we caught up, and she has gone from nursing manager to director of nursing. And this girl is under 30, y'all. It blew my mind. I was like, shut up. Tell me more. What is the role like now that you're in this new position? And I mean, what made this episode so touching to me is because she was also immigrated from another country. So she talks about the challenges she went through immigrating into the U.S. system. Also, you know, fighting through some of those barriers like language and and different different ways of communicating. Let's put it that way. But you know what? I'm already getting really excited because this is a really dope episode. So let me go ahead and hop into this. So let's go ahead and hop into this. Girl, since the last time we talked, you went from manager to now chief of nursing. Like, oh my gosh, tell me how you got there. That is amazing. Yeah, I know. Um, So it's, you know, I've been a nurse manager for about two years and I was thinking about the next step, right? Like what more can I do? And I thought about, you know, going quality, um, but I talked to my boss and some part of my regional team and they kind of felt like um, I sticking with the nursing and going up that way uh, would be better for me. So I applied for the position. It was, you know, I felt like as a nurse manager, I did similar things as the CNO and I got to sitting on a couple of things like joint commission um, coming through and other responsibilities, especially filling in for her when um, she's out. And so I kind of felt like I was somewhat ready for the next level, even though in all honesty, you're never ready for the next level. But Mm -hmm. at some point, you just have to pull the trigger and jump into it. So um, when the opportunity presented itself, um, I was like, you know what, this this is an okay time, right? It's not, I don't feel completely prepared or completely ready, but it's possible. And, you know, I read up on the hospital right up on the team there when I interviewed with them I made sure I asked a lot of questions to be sure I was walking into a supportive environment because I would need that for me to be able to grow and I definitely expressed that to them like during my interview when they asked about you know okay what are your what's your plan for the next three years and the next five years and I very much expressed at every point you know support and growth is definitely my plan because I also want to be able to support and grow people and show people the example that is possible. So that's how it that's how it started and that's how I got here. Wow. Like, first of all, I just want to table back a little bit because I'm in just in I'm in awe of you because you are like out there hitting the ground running and this sounds like it's impossible. You know, when we like we discussed before, when you're in an environment where all you see are, you know, older um, nurses with like years and years mm-hmm. and years of experience and here you in here you are hitting the ground running you did charge you moved up the ladder you did uh, management and now you are you know chief operating of uh, nursing for your for your hospital or your clinic and to me that's just amazing yeah 
really, you're breaking through those stereotypes and those traditional rigid, um, let's just say rigid ways. And you're showing them it's not about how extensive, extensively long you've been in the field, but what you're doing in that field. You know what I mean? Was this, um, was this opportunity an opportunity in-house? Like you moved up the chain of ladder based off of your connections or based off of what you've been doing in this one specific area, or this is a whole nother hospital. Talk to me about how you climbed up. Absolutely. So no, it is in-house and, and referring back to our first podcast, you know, about me being in the nurse manager role, um, you certainly want to move up in-house because they are the people that have spent enough time with you to understand your potential and are willing to take that risk, especially, again, being that underdog that doesn't have a wealth of, of years of experience, right? Even though you have the schooling, which is good, those years of experience always speak something of you. So being that underdog, a lot of people are skeptical or apprehensive towards going with you However, in house, you have given you have been given the opportunity to prove yourself, and this is something that I've told, um, like some of my house supervisors and and another nurse manager that's looking to grow is, um, you know, you hear these things about dress for the job that you want to have, right? The job exactly. you're looking for, but also behave in that manner. Yes. So if you're one year into your job right now, like I was one year into a nurse manager position, oh, my goal is to learn everything about that so I can excel in it. However, once I'm getting to a, after that year, my goal needs to be, I need to start showing that I'm capable of the next level, right? Still keep up your job. You've, you've developed some expertise in it. Still keep up what you're doing and perform there. But start showing a little bit more initiative. Start showing more by showing them that you're prepared. And I, I'm really not trying to make anything of it, but I I had so many people that said, oh, this was well-deserved. It's about time you moved up. I'm, I'm not surprised to see you in this position. Everybody kept repeating that because I, I was able to show them that I was capable of stepping into those shoes while I was still working as a nurse manager. And I think that's very important to help in-house, give them, um, you know, the information or give them what they can see as potential in you for that next level. And then they wouldn't be apprehensive to push you on further. And, and I'm, a lot of companies love to promote in-house and, and mm-hmm. it speaks a lot to, to everybody. And even after I received this position and, you know, it was announced to the whole team, I had a nurse that came up to me and said, Hey, you know, I'm thinking about, because after I became the CNO, um, I, I had one of my house supervisors from night, he applied for my position. And then I had a nurse coming up to me and saying, Hey, do you think I can apply for that house supervisor position? I mean, it was just so awesome to see, to see that growth too. I kind of felt like, because I moved up two and three people now have started thinking about, you know what, maybe I should move up or mm-hmm. how can I move up? And they're coming to me and they're asking me that. And that was excellent. I think that was just great. That is awesome. And that truly is the mark of a leader. A lot of people are actually talking to a very good friend of mine. Um, and we were discussing about, you know, the, the um, steps of what a leader is. And a lot of people think a leader is just a person with a book of knowledge that just knows all the information and you go to them. And I said, no, a leader is a person that when you come to, uh-uh. they give you the knowledge, they equip you to feel prepared. So when you leave them, you feel confident in decisions that you're going to make. You also are growing. A leader is not Absolutely. just to lead people, but grow people so they can also be leaders. So I love that you highlight Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Because that is exactly what you're doing. Now you have motivated people. And I remember from our last episode, you were, you were talking about some people that were kind of stagnant and been there for 15, 20 years and never thought about, you know, yep. moving up. And now look, you've, you've been in there, hit mm-hmm. the ground running in less than like, less than four or five years, you went from manager to CNO. So I applaud you yes. for that. And I applaud you for even taking Thank the notion you. to bring people with you, girl, because that's what a leader really is. Oh, absolutely. I'm constantly talking to people about that. All my LVNs, I'm telling them, hey, when are you getting back in school? Because you never want an opportunity to present itself and you are not where you need to be to take that opportunity. You know, you don't have the credentials. You don't have what, you know, you, you haven't developed yourself enough. 
So that's why I tell people, make sure you're developing, your, developing yourself for the next level because when that opportunity presents itself, you need to be ready to jump on it. And people don't have to be scared and you don't have to be scared of, oh, I haven't really done much. No, but you have. So you're ready for it. Absolutely, girl. I agree with you. And that's why you were ready to take on this next new role. So as we talk about this, what does a chief of nursing operations actually do? Like, give me a good rundown of, of what a day in a life is for you now in this new role. So in this new role, um, of course, complete responsibility of the entire nursing department is on you. So everything that happens um, is on you and you're responsible 24-7. Uh, for that department, for the patients that are being taken care of, for the nurses, the techs, I have respiratory, radiology, I mean, wound care, it's a lot. But um, a big difference I've seen for me is is having a seat at the big table, right? So sitting with the CEO and all the other directors and even with the regional team, having a lot of meetings every day. Um, to understand what's going on in different aspects of the hospital, but also in your department and the initiatives and the goals for the hospital. So being privy to that uh, is definitely a huge change that has come about it. And so most of my day, I'm in, uh, I'm in several meetings from operations all the way um, through a STEM class, which is a, which is special to rehab. Um, and definitely, I have to spend time with my nursing leadership also because I need to concentrate on my nursing staff and the quality of care we're providing for that day. So I'm overseeing all of that. It's a lot of delegation because a lot comes to you um, from every from every part, from every mm. aspect. You know, HR needs collaboration with the nursing department, so they come to you to figure out a way to collaborate together. The therapy department needs collaboration with the nursing department, and they're coming to you. Um, health information, medical services, the doctors for having problems with labs. You have to um, collaborate with so many disciplinary um, parts of the hospital for your team and take it to them, as well as manage everything that's going on that day. So a huge chunk of it is delegation and following up and following through on different things. So you have to constantly delegate things and kind of direct people on what to do and what needs to be done because you are the one that sees the, the big picture and you're, the, you're that visionary that sees everything that's happening and you know the why and you have to find a way to tell it to your team and direct them in the way that they need to go so that you can get to that big picture goal. So it's really a lot of that. And then, of course, developing your team um, because you want them to grow and do more for the hospital. Wow. And that's literally what I was going to ask you. Is it more of office work or more of delegations? And it sounds like it's a little bit of both, where you are doing a lot of delegations, overseeing several departments, and also being the key player to a lot of these inter, um, inter interdisciplinary teams, which is amazing. So... You now being in the role of the CNO, do you feel like your staff are able to come to you and relate to you more because they've watched you grow into those positions and they know that you are actually advocating for them? Or do you feel like there's some, there's some kind of um, distance between, oh, you know, now you're really higher up and we're just down here? How do you, or what is your perception on that? And how do you merge that where they don't feel that disconnect? Oh, absolutely. Actually, I should, and I probably should have mentioned this earlier on to correct um, this. So I worked for a corporation, right? And so the hospital I was working at was where I was the nurse manager. Now I'm, I'm in a bigger hospital in the same corporation. So we're functioning the same way, but it's entirely new team uh, that I'm working with actually right now. But I can tell you how I've been able to break that barrier or bring more ease and rapport with my team is by, again, being so visual on the floor. So I'm rounding the moment I walk in. I'm rounding somewhere in the afternoon. And I'm rounding in the evening before I leave so I can catch a little bit of night shift. And I'm meeting everybody. Um, and I have had one-on-ones already with a number of my house supervisors who have come to me about, you know, certain issues that they've had with um, staff, holding staff accountable and staff feeling like, you know, the supervisor is mean or rude to them and helping that supervisor through that process. And I think that that's, I'm able to do that because 
I've been open to them. I've been rounding on them and just talking to them, not giving them work to do, but just popping in and saying, hello, how's your day going? And visiting with them a little bit so they know that, hey, you can just always talk to me. And so they, if they catch me in the hallway, they'll say, hey, can I talk to you uh, for a minute? Actually, had a nurse tech that needed to talk to me about a new position that opened because she knew a friend of hers that wanted um, to move up. And she wanted to ask, just ask my opinion, what kind of credentials do you need to be able to move into this role? It was a nurse manager role. And so knowing that that's where I come from and I'm already in a CNO level, she was asking me, what do you think are the credentials uh, for someone that's looking for a nurse manager position? And this is not even a position at my hospital, but she just felt like I was a good resource for her to help her friend. And, and, and I really liked that because it showed that I was able to show them they can always just come to me and talk to me um, about anything. And I love how they're so respectful of my time because they can see and can tell that I'm very busy and I'm going from one meeting to the other. Mm-hmm. And so people would just say, hey, when you have a minute, can you call you know, my extension and let me know? And sometimes when I go up to the floor, I'll just say, hey, if you have a minute now, let's go to my office and talk about that thing that you told me about in the morning. That is awesome. Like, girl, thank you for doing that because that seems to be the main big thing for a lot of hospitals and the culture is, you know, not having a CNO or anyone in the C-suite to come down to their level and actually talk to them, engage with them and let them feel like they're a part of the whole organization and not just, oh, I just work on this unit and we just see them at, you know, whenever we're talking about joint commission or whenever we're talking about these bigger topics, that's the only time they show up. And from my experience, I mean, when I- Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hundred percent. I mean, when I first started in my nursing career, one of the things that stuck out to me the most, and this stuck out to me a lot because one, I'm a woman of color and my um, director of nursing was a woman of color and she was an amazing woman. And I never knew that what she was doing in the morning was round, but every morning she would, we see her every morning. Like she is a part of us, you know, she's on the unit. She's looking at schedules. She's checking things. She's having a moment to talk to you and engage with you. She was actually one of the first people I told the first time I felt the NCLEX, I I felt so comfortable enough to talk to her and get some advice from her and encouragement during that time where I felt like crap, you know, and being someone who is, who is out there and open, you, your staff can relate to you and talk to you and they know that you're out there for their better interest and you're there to encourage them to grow versus those other directors or CNOs that, you know, like to stay in the C-suite only. You know what I mean? Exactly. And it's so important that, that you do that. And that's certainly something that I kept in mind when I was working on the floor and knew what kind of nurse manager I wanted to be. And therefore I knew what kind of CNO I wanted to be. Uh, because it, it's not it's not an elite group. It's not anything to hold high up um, more than the staff on the floor. You always have to remind yourself that at the core, you are still a nurse, you know. And so Absolutely. you have to be able to continue to relate with them on that level. And it helps them feel more comfortable in their role, just knowing that I have a boss that I can talk to. I mean, I have a house supervisor, I have a nurse manager, and I have a CNO. I mean, nothing can go wrong on my shift because I have three leaders that are working with me uh, to make sure that I'm successful. And, you know, when you're in that role as a CNO, you feel like you have people in place to manage the unit and everything going on, like a nurse manager, like a house supervisor. And that is true within their scope of practice. But I think just for group dynamics and even for that nurse manager, that house supervisor, your presence on the floor shows that added support for them um, because it shows the nursing staff, for one, that you're another resource that they can come to, but also it shows that nurse manager as well as that house supervisor that you care about the work they do and you want to be a resource to them. Uh, so you always have to, you can never forget the part of leadership that has to do with service and you have to serve every single person and every single part of your department still by being present and meeting with them frequently. Wow. Thank you for that overview, girl. Cause that's so, so needed and very important. 
So I kind of want to change the topic really quick because I know, let's just say for those who haven't got to um, listen to the amazing interview that I did with you just a couple of months back on um, being a nurse manager, I, I wanted to kind of get a feel or give my audience a feel of where you kind of started your journey, like from when you graduated to moving up in the ladder and what did you do intentionally to grow within those years to where you are now as a CNO? Absolutely. So um, before I graduated from nursing school, because I was just really excited about being a nurse and everything I was learning about, I actually started applying and interviewing uh, for positions. And in all honesty, the first job offer I got that last semester of nursing school, I just took it because I, I loved my boss from the interview and the team seemed really awesome. And so I just accepted that position. And as soon as I graduated, I think maybe a week or two later, I graduated in December after Christmas, I packed up and I left and I started working on the floor. So I started working as a graduate nurse because I hadn't taken my NCLEX yet. And so I got that graduate license uh, from the Board of Nursing and I started working. Um, I was a little bit apprehensive because I was, you know, you always want to feel like, well, what if I don't pass my test and then what happens? But that's another great thing about a supportive boss. You know, when she hired me, she felt like I had the potential uh, to really provide quality care to her patients. And so she just encouraged me that, you know, as long as I study and whatever time I needed to take off to make sure I was prepared for the test when it's coming around, she was willing to do that for me. And so I was more confident going in. I started as a graduate nurse. Um, you know, I took like a week or so off and studied for my boards and I took that and I passed it, which was awesome and started out as a nurse on a med surge unit. Um, however, I wanted to really learn so much more and grow so more, uh, so much more that I worked literally almost every floor, um, in the hospital. I worked, uh, neuro, which was nine central. Um, I worked an, a specialized education unit for Texas Tech which was the seventh floor right below mine. I worked post-op, pre-op, um, ortho. I worked rehab. I worked oncology. I worked cardiac. Only places I didn't get to work were um, CCU, ICU, and ER because you had to go for more specialized training for those. And um, I, I didn't feel like I was ready to go through that yet. And so I just kept working and I kept growing. I kept reading. Every day I would read progress notes written by doctors and I would look at labs and try to paint a picture of what's going on with the patient by myself. Um, and then eventually I enrolled to start my master's um, because of a couple of reasons. Uh, for one, I was involved in several committees at work and I felt like um, I wanted to be part of the people that make changes for the nursing department. Mm. And so I, I knew I needed to move up um, in my position to be able to do that. Uh, my boss encouraged me to take up a charge nurse position, which I did. Um, but I realized that as a charge nurse, you are influential to your nurses on the floor. However, you're not, you're an implementer, right? You're the one that implements, but not necessarily um, creates the, um, the ideas or the processes that you feel like need to be in place. And so at that point also, and I think uh, we covered this as well in um, the last podcast, was I, being an international student, I also had to continue to remain legal in, in the United States. And so that was a great opportunity for me to do both things. So by re-enrolling back to get my master's, I was able to stay legal um, in the United States. And then also I was getting that knowledge or that information and that experience that I needed to move up to the next level so I could be a game changer for the nursing department. And so it worked out perfectly that way. I, I started my master's and I, I finished that. I was still in my charge nurse role, uh, still actively uh, in committees in the hospital. And once I was done, in about six months or so, it took me a while because I was moving from that town elsewhere you know, to find a job and a good place that I, I felt um, comfortable with and I would settle in. And, and I did. I applied for a position um, in Dallas and I interviewed at a couple of places in Austin, Dallas, different areas. And I settled on one that I felt like was the right fit for me um, in my nurse manager role. 
And at every point, you know, having a little bit of leadership, being a charge nurse definitely gave me somewhat of a, a leeway. Having a master's degree definitely showed that I was somebody that was serious about my education and I was qualified enough to go through but and, and getting me into the interview. And in the interview with behavioral questions and things like that, I was able to show that I've handled situations um, that is close to what a nurse manager would do and that I have the potential to really function as a nurse manager. And that's something, um, and that was great. And they, and they took a chance on me and that was awesome. And I was able to come in and start in that role. But knowing that the best way to grow is in-house, I, I you know, took up my strategy that I talked about where I developed myself in my nurse manager role and, and excelled in that. And then I started applying myself in other leadership things um, that, you know, when the CNO was out, making sure I wasn't just covering, right? I'm not just holding the fort till she comes back. No, we are functioning as though there's a CNO here. And so putting myself in those, in those meetings, speaking up in those meetings, um, showing what the nursing department is doing, coming up with processes, working with my boss and other disciplines on developing processes for the nursing department, I was able to show that I had the potential to run the department myself. And so when, again, the opportunity presented itself to move up, um, I felt like I was ready and a lot of people felt like I was truly ready and that I functioned in that role very well, especially in the absence of my CNO whenever she was gone. And so I was able to jump on it. And being in-house, of course, they love growth as well, and they did not have a problem moving forward with me. Wow. So what is the time frame between when you graduated to where you are now? What's the years in between this process? Um, so I graduated December of 2012. So I would say six years, six years. See, that's what I'm talking I'm about. That's up on six years now. <laughs> Go get her. Yeah. Girl, you, you were legit <laughs> real. Wow. And of course, you know, we yeah. don't like to drop actual age, but I will say you were under 30 and you were doing the dang thing. Okay. So I am just, I'm impressed. <laughs> Not yeah. only because of your um, your persistence, but really your growth and you actually, you know, showing that there is no boundaries. You know, the sky is not the limit. You can go beyond that. And there's no, um, there's nothing holding you back, whether it's years and years of having to be at the bedside or whatever it is. You knew what your goal was and you went for it. And, and I'm glad that you're on this platform sharing that. So a lot of other millennials and generations that are coming up can hear this and know that you can strive for what you want. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And something, you know, I, I will tell you something that my current CEO said to me that was, you know, I really appreciated that. And he said, you know, being, being an underdog, number one, because of my years of experience, uh, not having a lot of years of experience is something that encouraged him to go with me because I was an underdog, but I was so passionate that he knew I was going to be that loyal person that would work hard to grow the department and to prove myself. And that is accurate. But something else he also said was, hey, I was interviewing, you know, somebody that had 20 years of experience as well. And to me, I feel like you can have 20 years of experience or you can have one year of experience for doing it 20 times. Mm. Right. Wow. So, so exactly. And, and that was so instrumental because it's not about, you know, how much the years exactly it's the quality of the years and yes. how much you're able to accomplish yes. and do. So you have somebody that in two years has grown a department from this level to that level, has changed the morale of the department, developed a number of employees um, to a certain level versus someone that has just held the fort for exactly. 20 years compared exactly. to somebody who has accomplished so much in two years. So once you, you get an opportunity to show what you have done and that is so important, then those years start to fall off because it's about the worth and the quality of the work that you do versus just the time frame of holding the fort down. 
I love that. I really, really do. Like that was so instrumental, um, the way that you said that. And I hope the people, whoever's listening to this is writing this down and putting it on their computer or writing on their walls and sticking on a reminder. You know, it's about the um, the quality, not necessarily the quantity. You know, you can have, like you said, 20 years of doing just holding down the fort compared to one year of changing the fort, rebuilding and putting a duplex in there and, and, and a townhouse. And, you know, you're doing so much more with, um, <laughs> with less time. Right. And that's what, that's what we're looking yep. for in healthcare. Healthcare is changing so much. They're not looking for anyone to hold down the fort anymore. We're looking for people who are adding to the innovations and the changes in healthcare, not just keeping it um, streamlined. That's not, that's not where we're going anymore. So I'm glad that you said that. I actually want to, kind of talk to you about um, your background, because I find you not only inspirational in the nursing aspect, but I find you very inspirational and influential in the background of being an African-American, um, or actually, in correction, being an African who is living in America um, and, and changing from one culture and country and trying to adapt into this country. So can we talk about, you know, your experiences as a Nigerian who has immigrated to America and some of the challenges you kind of faced, you know, in nursing school and, and, and how did you over, overcome that, not only in nursing school, but in your career? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I want to say that I've overcome a lot, but I think to a certain extent, it's an ongoing process mm. because every day, every day, one opportunity or another, you show that you are different. Um, and, and I love that. I really do love that because once you're authentic with yourself, people start to recognize that. And with the way even, even America is changing and a lot of people are migrating here, people are becoming more fascinated in a positive way about even our culture. So remaining, I just want to put out there that remaining authentic to your culture is absolutely important. And Very important. it's great that you assimilate into this culture and all of it, but we're all growing together. And so I think that people are coming to appreciate our cultural diversity as well. Mm -hmm. But I will say that it has been a huge struggle I mean, I moved here when I was 17 years old, and all I've known was Nigeria. I, this was a complete culture shock for me in, in several ways. Um, you know, as, as basic as calling people by their first name, right? Um, because that's what they prefer. Yes. Oh so my the gosh. type of food that you eat, to how people approach you, to, to, to your accent, how people understand you and when you speak, to... My English class, I was writing in, in, and everything I spelled was the British way. It wasn't the American way. You know, I had mm. that extra U in color and favor and all of that. So it, in every aspect and in every step, there's, there's a cultural difference where you have to be open to accept the culture that you're in and move forward with that and push through with that. I know that I've talked to so many people um, about oh the, my approach uh, you know the way I'm speaking to you is is because of my, in my culture that's okay I'll, I'll give you a perfect example when I was a charge nurse I had this um, patient family member that was complaining about something a nurse did well I'm being being a Nigerian I think to a certain level we can be really loud mm -hmm. and so when mm -hmm. she told me about what happened you know I was upset. And so I was, when I was talking to her about it, I was passionately expressing myself, but I was yes. loud because I was yes. passionate, but she felt like I was upset with her. And she stopped me and said, okay, like, you don't have to be upset with me about it. And I felt very bad about that. I was like, oh no, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying, I'm, I'm not upset with you. I'm actually agreeing with you. But she's like, well, you're just really coming at me so strong and loud. And I, I think for a lot of, you know, Africans, Nigerians from other cultures, you have, you definitely have experiences like this where somebody misinterprets you. But the best way to come out of that is to dig deep inside and say, you know what? Yes, this is how I am as a Nigerian, but right now I am a professional. Mm. And in this culture that I live in and I work in and I have my professional life in, 
it is important that I speak to them at a certain level. It doesn't change who I am. It doesn't change the fact that I'm loud. When I'm amongst Nigerians, I'm a very loud person. We all loud, girl. But I understand girl. that. Mm, exactly. We all loud. But I understand that to be able to pass on that message in for them to understand me, I need to adopt that culture of how I speak with them just because what's most important is the message I'm passing across. It doesn't have to change me. And I mean, several different things, several, I, I'm not even sure where I will start to express um, the culture shock, the culture change and, and different. You just have to modify yourself, but keep true to who you are to make sure that at every point your message is being passed across and not to take anything personal. Girl. I'm just, it's funny because you're saying this as a, um, as a immigrant from Nigeria. And then I am an American born Nigerian and the same things that you kind of faced were kind of the same things I faced in a different, I guess in a different way. Like, um, especially calling someone by their first name was not going to happen. Like the way our parents raised us. No, you call someone by their last name or as auntie, uncle, you got to greet them a certain way. And I kid you not, I know this might sound completely funny and weird, but my first preceptor, who is now like my lifetime best friend, um, she was my first pre- preceptor and she was Caucasian. And I could not call her by her first name. It was the most, because di- she's older. Anyone who's old, in our culture, anyone who's older than you, it's like a disrespect to call them by their first name. And I could not call her by her first name. Mm-hmm. So I would joke around and be like, I'm just going to call you Auntie Kim. And she was like, okay. Like she didn't care. <laughs> And I'm not getting like, at least for four months straight, I'll be calling her, hey, Auntie Kim, I need you to help me with this. <laughs> and she, just, <laughs> she didn't understand, but I was just trying to explain to her, like, you know, in my culture, I just, it's hard for me. And I had to take my culture and what I've been taught. I had to separate that from my um, practice. Mm-hmm. You know, this is my profession. I need to be professional. And in this realm, you address people by their names, you know, whether, whatever you're taught, you yeah. It's almost like you're fighting within yourself. Like, oh, this feels really weird. I feel like my mom going to come out of nowhere and slap me real quick if I don't call her by her, <laughs> by her uh, name wrong. So that I truly understood. And another thing was like you were saying about us being loud and, and we're, just, we're just very passionate people. And when we talk, we talk with a lot mm-hmm. of passion, but people think we're yelling or we're, we're mad at them. And it's like, they think we're trying to fight. And it's like, no, I'm just very passionate about the topic and having to learn to, to separate when that's appropriate. Like it's appropriate at home. It's appropriate when you're playing taboo in a room full of Nigerians, but it's not appropriate on the unit. It's not appropriate when you're even trying to grow up in leadership and have one-on-one with staff, you know, and some staff might think, oh, you know, my manager is so like mean and she yells at me and da 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 when it's really just us talking of our passion. So I can definitely relate to that. And I know a lot of um, listeners who were, you know, coming from different cultural backgrounds can relate to that too. So how did you balance out? Because when I talk to you, I don't hear an accent at all. How did you overcome that? Because I know a lot of people are thinking, how did I can't be where she is because I have an accent and it's going to get in my way of moving up in the ladder. How do you address um, people from other cultural aspects that kind of have that thought process? Well, you know, for me, I mean, growing up, I will say that English was my first language. I did start off speaking English before I, I learned a native tongue. So I don't know if that has to do with it, but um You know, when when you talk to people and they, you know, they go, huh, what? You're trying to repeat yourself so many times, right? So after a while, you start picking up on the way they pronounce things. I still have many times, people will catch me and say, hmm, I can hear an accent there. Where are you originally from? And then I will tell them, oh, I'm originally from Nigeria. And I'm very proud to say that. And they're like, oh, I can understand you so well. And I tell them, yes. That is true. Yes, I do. I understand English uh, and, you know, expressing myself is very important, but I've always felt like the message is so important that, and I want you to hear me, that if I have to pronounce the word the way that you're more familiar with so that you can get my message, that is what I'm going to do. Now, when you find me with a group of Nigerians, my accent automatically comes out stronger there with them. But even a little bit there, it still crosses back and forth. Now, 
also, I know that I came here when I was 17. So I was, I was, you know, relatively young and still in my formative years. So that might have something to do with it. Um, I don't think anybody should feel like they have to change their accent. I think part of it is being open to pronouncing you know, words, the way that people here are familiar or are, are the way they pronounce it, just so that you can communicate, express, and pass on a message to them. That is the deal. You are not taking any part of yourself away. Absolutely not. I don't think there is a way that you would be around your people and not have your accent. It's just, it's, it's innate because mm-hmm. you've grown up with that. However, when you're functioning in a professional environment, something else is expected of you and so you you have to have a different different level of decorum right the way you present yourself and one of it is just being able to communicate it's simply that you're not changing who you are you're just ensuring that you're communicating for them to hear you and so if that takes you pronouncing the words in a way that they can hear it to receive your message then i say why not do that because this is a professional environment. The standards are much different from you. It doesn't change your belief and your nature and who you are. All you're doing is modifying your communication skills, which is something that everybody does in different ways. It just seems that yours would be with pronunciation, but with other people, it could be their approach as their level of communication. I, I really like how you said that because it's true. The way we go, like you went back to school to get your master's to advance in your career, right? The, uh, I would go to tons of leadership yeah. conferences or, or leadership engagements to advance in my career. It, I, it's what you invest in yourself that's what's going to be able to, to flourish out of you. So the way you're saying that, you know, learn, take some classes to learn on pronunciation or, or communication classes. Everyone's taking that and that's something that's needed. Mm-hmm. Um, I would encourage that because I know many, many friends of mine that that sometimes is a, a stumbling block for them is just the way they communicate. And it gets really frustrating. You know, I, I'm i married to my husband who's from Nigeria and he vents to me a lot the frustration of having to repeat yourself several times or even the way... Right even hearing someone and not knowing what they're saying because you've never really heard it in that, in that kind of way. You know, when you learn these words from another country, your dialect is how you pronounce it. Now, when you go to another country and they're pronouncing that same mm-hmm. word, you have no idea what they're saying, even though it's the same word because they're not pronouncing in the dialect that you pronounced it in. So it's a learning curve. Exactly. Or it's a learning curve. It's a true learning curve. But, um, Hearing you and hearing how you went from, you know, coming into this country at a young age, getting to where you are in, um, in this leadership level, it's inspiring to others to realize that if this is what the path that you want, invest in yourself. You know, you're not alone. It is possible. Yeah. Um, but to me, it, it just means so much more to hear from you it, telling this and explaining this because you are in a leadership position and you are an immigrant in this country. It's not like, oh my gosh, you know, you're a full blown citizen. No, you're going through the same process. You're watching the news mm-hmm. in the same way we're watching the news. You're hearing all this the same way we're hearing this. So, can you talk to me about how are you overcoming that? Does that give you any sense of frustration, any sense of fear? Just, you know, not knowing what's going on in our climate right now, um, especially when it relates to people migrating to this country oh absolutely um you know when you come here there's a lot of barriers honestly as an international student you are you're trying to make it professionally you're trying to get that education but and you're also trying to make sure that you make something of yourself because i don't know i don't know about other people but for me you know, getting that first tuition together and my ticket and with our exchange rate, that was a lot of money that my mom put together for me to come here. So I need to get the education. I need to make something of myself because of the sacrifice that she had to make to send me to this country so that I can have a better future. I need to have that better future. But you also have a situation of, oh, I need to be able to help my family, help whoever is back home, you know, help my parents, help my siblings especially when you're the first person that comes to the, to the country. So a lot of these things you have going on for you, and you also have to be able to remain here legally. 
So, yeah. you know, so, so you want to stay abreast of what's going on in the news and with immigration and all that, because you want to be able to stay in this country. That's the best way that you're going to make something of yourself. You're going to make money and be able to help and direct your family and, and other people that might want to come, um, come here. And, and, and you're scared and you're fighting through this every day. But you have to network and you have to be strategic and you have to be thinking about the next step before anybody else. You can't just sit down and function like everybody else is in America. You have so many barriers against you. For one, you are not a United States citizen or a permanent resident when you first come here going to yeah. college. Yeah. So you cannot just sit down and go through life like they are. No, you have to be three times smarter. You have to be thinking about the next three levels, the next three steps. Okay, what can I do here? How can I coordinate myself? And you have to learn the culture here. I remember um, learning about, you know, I was in the honors program to get scholarships um, to get a reduced tuition to, to go to school here, right? But also being in the honors program, I, you know, learned about how if you want to building up your resume so when you graduate you want to show that you're active in co in committees and and different part of student life at your organization or your your university okay i never knew that okay my oh, brother wow. didn't do, didn't do that when he was in college in nigeria but i was open i received that information and i got involved in several committees and I, I even rose up to be the president of the honors program of my university and I plugged myself in there because I needed to have that resume. I needed to have the the 4.0 GPA or a high GPA uh, to be able to stay in the honors program. I needed to have a high GPA on my resume because when people read my first name and my last name, they're going to know I'm not American. Mm -hmm. So I need to prove myself on that resume so that they can invite me for an interview and I can articulate well to them that I am I'm, I'm a good employee that they can have. So I needed, I needed to get that resume right. I need to have the right GPA. Um, I needed to make sure that I was actively in those committees and showing that there because this is an American thing. Americans want to see that you're involved in more than just going to class and, 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 and getting good grades. They want exactly. to see you in the community. Exactly. So I had to put that on there. And so when I was working on the floor, and I was preparing my resume for the next step. I was involved in other committees. And now my objective or my intro, even on my LinkedIn profile and, and on my resume, always says that when I come into an organization, I don't want to just come in there and be a part of one department and grow one department. I like to plug myself into other aspects and grow the organization. That is an American thing. Wow. That's not what we know of growing up back home. And that's something you have to learn and be open to learn and hear and receive from them, from people here to be able to progress in America. Because when, when in Rome, you want to act like the Romans. Hello. That's what's up. I just, girl, everything you said was just true gems. And I hope that it's being received by whoever is listening to this because it's not easy being an immigrant to this country, being able to um, adapt to the culture. Just like you said, I mean, especially for me, you know, I'm married to an immigrant husband. We, I'm plugged into everything that happens because we don't know what tomorrow is going to be. And we have to, oh my gosh, we literally have to do three times harder. You know, we have to work three times harder. We yeah. have to be on our toes way before. I mean, we're thinking about the next step before we even finish the current step we're in. We are two steps ahead. And I mean, that's really the life that you have to live when you have migrated into a country where you're not fully a citizen. So what advice would you give um, other immigrants who are probably listening to this, who are trying to, you know, um, move into the career of nursing? but also move up. And, you know, some of them are kind of, I know I've heard a lot that people are kind of fearful of moving up into position because they're not sure if they're going to be here tomorrow in this country. They're not sure if they're going to be removed. You know, they're not sure if they're going to get their green card or get to be a permanent resident. So what advice would you give to someone who is coming from a different cultural background and migrated to the United States of America, but they want to climb up in their career, but are kind of hesitant due to maybe language barriers or due to the barrier of not being fully in, um, fully adapted to this country, what kind of advice could you give them? 
Oh, absolutely. Um, you certainly want to, okay, you know, and that, and that's the risk with it. You can, you have to live your life, especially when it, you're in America being an international person, you want to make the most of it. I know that that's why we all come here to make the most of it. So the fear of what's going to happen, you know, from a, a legal standpoint with immigration is, is definitely true and real, but you cannot let that stop you. But which means that you have to put in the work to make sure you're going, you've got what, what it needs, what, what it takes, and you're secured and you're legal here. So you, that's, why, and that's why I talk about you can't just function like every other college student and, and just, oh, I'm just going to, you know, go to class and chill and go hang out for this party and go there. No, you're working twice as hard. Okay, you're working on your grades. You're working on your immigration status. You're networking because there are a lot of immigrants, not just Nigeria, that have come here and they have found a way to stay here and they've made it through. You need to network and be smart. You need to be smarter than everybody else. Network as soon as possible. Not when you're a junior or you're a senior ready to graduate. You need to start networking in freshman year so that by the time you're graduating in, in your senior year, you already know your plan for the next two years and how you're going to stay in this country legally. And do I know multiple people that have had to go for different degrees just to stay here legally? Absolutely. I have yes. people that have two different degrees yeah. just because they needed a way to stay here so that they could work and make something of themselves. If that's what is required, you start working on that as soon as possible and you move on that way. I have a very close friend of mine, wonderful, beautiful person that through her networking found an agency that I'm telling you when I was in nursing school in 2012, people said hospitals are not filing for nurses anymore. And this is 2018. And she found an agency that is going to file for her to get a green card. In a year, she has her green card. Wow. She just needs to give the agency three years um, working, work with them for three years. And then she's off on her own. Wow. And this is 2018 when I was in nursing school, people said, no hospitals are not filing anymore for nurses. And 2018, there is an agency that is filing a green card, not an H-1B visa, but a green card for nurses to work in the United States. But if you don't network and you don't talk to people and you don't get plugged in, you don't hear things like this. Mm -hmm. And so you... You get one perspective from one person, but that's why you continue to network. You continue to get involved in different areas and somebody can show you a different way. But you do not wait until you're in your senior year or in your sophomore year or in your you know, junior year to say, okay, maybe I should start. The moment you, you set foot in this country, you need to know that you are working three times harder and you have to be three times smarter to be where you need to be and you realize at the point, just like me, when you get there, you've grown so much and made so much of yourself, you're actually excelling uh, than most people that are actually native born here. But that's because you invested that time to be three times smarter and work three times harder to get to where you need to be the right way, because it is so, it is very possible. Wow. I'm just, whew, Sharon, you're giving me like goosebumps because I'm just so... I applaud you so much because I know sometimes in our culture, we have the tendency to be very private um, and very like, yeah. oh, you don't want to tell someone what you're doing, you know, whether it's culturally or spiritually or whatever the, the lingo is that, you know, you don't want to let somebody know what you're doing or what you've gone through. You want to just live this secret life right. that everything is great and then just post pictures and go to events like your life is perfect, but there are challenges. So thank you for there not are. being a part of that mentality. Thank you for being transparent. Thank you for talking about these things because so many people are going through it, but no one wants to talk about it. So no one knows, you know, no one knows, period. Like no one knows what to do, but you being so open to your, your, your struggles and your success 
is so pivotal to those who are listening to this episode who are probably going through that same season. So I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and from on the behalf of my listeners for sharing this, sharing from how you went from a new grad to a CNO, sharing from how you came into this country 17 and how you had to stay and be legal in this country and how you're doing it and climbing up in the ladder of leadership. It's amazing. So I thank you so much for your time. And, and I just want to honor you with that. Thank you so much. Not a problem. And, you know, when you start talking about it, there, there's so much, you know, I don't even know if, if the time frame that we have for a podcast show can cover the wealth of it. But that's why that networking and talking through situations is very important. You know, and and I'm always open to tell people, I can tell them the honest truth about, you know, how I did any specific thing, what struggles I've had, you know, at one point where, you know, I felt a part of, be it racism or be the fact that I'm from Africa or be the fact that I'm I'm young or be the fact that I'm a woman, I faced that in in, in different ways, even professionally, um, as well as, as personally. And how to overcome all of that, you know, and, and network with other people, too, um, just so that you can get that information from them and you can go through it. Because we all go through things. And, and you're right. Nigerians, we like to be private. And, and I'm a relatively private person. But if I'm going to help somebody and I'm going to show somebody the way based on my experience, then why not? Especially because I'm not a failure. And so I will, I will show you places and how I have failed at different things, but I've come through that to be who I am now. So exactly. I am Sharon Abami. I'm not a failure. So I have every confidence to share with you all the things I failed in because I am not a failure and I'm excelling right now. And I'm going to fail in some more things. But I'm going to excel at so much more that even when I'm still there, I will share with some of the failures that I'm yet to go through now. Because I, as a person, I'm not a failure. We're all in this world. We're all here to help each other out. And if I'm going to tell you my story and you feel like, oh, that's that's bad. That's a failure. Well, that's you and your interpretation. That's nothing to do with me personally. I'm not a failure. So I'm open to share and be transparent. And, And I really feel like, a lot of people should because that's what you need to really make it. I hope you've enjoyed today's podcast episode. There were so many gems dropped. But let's be honest, who got time to replay, pause, and write down all that information shared? Shoo, I know I don't. But don't worry, I got you. Download Toby Talks app on Google Play for nursing resources, definitions, and so much more that were mentioned on today's episode. Toby Talk app features show notes that timelines the conversation and lets you click directly to the resource or definition. And it even lets you bookmark the gem for later. Listen, we're too busy learning how to save lives or even saving lives as nurses to deal with a replay button. Toby Talk app is your one-stop shop for podcast episodes and show notes. For more on Toby Talks, like the blogs and videos, go to my website at www.tobytodge.com. And you know I love to hear from you guys, so feel free to slide into my DMs on IG or Facebook and hit me up through email. That's tobytalks at tobytodge.com. Again, that's tobytalks at tobytodge.com. Till next time, I'll be talking to you soon.